It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Sugarman. Uh, Jeff is uh, the director and founder of Redwood Family Dermatology, which is a section of Northern California Medical Associates. And uh, Jeff brings a lot of uh, uh, experience uh, to this talk, and he uh, and he's sort of the archetypical uh, physician who's both an academician and uh, and in practice. So he really has a wealth of information. His uh, undergraduate uh, and, and graduate training is all through the University of California, Berkeley, then San Diego, and then uh, he's a board-certified pediatrician and then board-certified in uh, dermatology for adults and, and for children. So uh, he brings a great deal of expertise to this talk. Jeff, I'd like to welcome you. Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for inviting me to speak here. For someone who's somewhat academic, I'm going to give a very non-academic talk for your last talk of the day. I find that uh, what people really want to know uh, when they hear a Durham lecture often is basic stuff. What am I looking at? And once I know what I'm looking at, how would the dermatologist manage that, and can I do some of that management myself? And so we're not going to talk a lot about genetics or pro fusion proteins. We're just going to get really back to the basics. I'm going to show you a lot of clinical images, a lot of pictures. Derm's very visual. And I want to try to keep it somewhat informal, even though it's a, it's a pretty big room. So I might stop at the different segues between the topics I'm going to talk about uh, and just stop for questions so we can do some question and answer uh, during the talk as well as at the end. Um, so, um, the first uh, little mini section, I just want to talk about sunscreens and some of the sunscreen and tanning myths that I get asked about a lot. If I get asked about them, maybe you have some of these same uh, questions that come into your office. So, so myth number one is um, I need a base tan before my trip to Hawaii. And um, uh, we really know that uh, people who go to tanning beds, they get almost completely uh, UVA treatment. And UVA just photooxidizes melanin in the skin. So you don't really get any photo protection from a tan that you get in a tanning salon. Ultraviolet B uh, will give you some uh, SPF, maybe two or three. But it's not worth the trade-off, because when you're getting UVB exposure, uh, you're getting a DNA and cellular damage, as you guys all know. So um, myth number two. Using sunscreen will make me vitamin D deficient. Um, so possibly, depending on who you are, um, if you've got black skin or very dark skin, then um, you may have, and it's winter, and you live in a northern uh, climate, uh, maybe you will have some problems with vitamin D deficiency. But the people that we worry about that we recommend sunscreen for are fair skinned and maybe have a history of sun damage. You really don't need that much sun to make vitamin D. And what I tell patients is that if you're worried about vitamin D synthesis or vitamin, you know, your vitamin D level, uh, just take it in a pill form. Don't use that as an excuse to get extra sun. So uh, you just take vitamin D supplementation. OK, myth number three, I don't need to use sunscreen because there's always sunscreen in my makeup or moisturizer. Well, most people who use moisturizers or makeups with sunscreens apply them when they wake up and they're getting dressed for work or school. So that's 7.30 in the morning. Uh, that lasts about three hours. So but if they take a midday walk, uh, they have no protection at all. So you get sort of a false sense of security about that. The other thing that you need to realize is the amount of SPF in those products is fairly low, 15, maybe if you're lucky, SPF 20. And as you'll see later in the next couple slides, um, that's really not adequate. So you get a false sense of security about those labels. I would, I tell my patients, if you want to wear sunscreen or to protect yourself from the sun, wear sunscreen. And if you're really, your primary objective is moisturizing or wearing makeup, then that's what you're really doing. Mixing them doesn't really work. Uh, so if you really want sun protection, put a sunscreen on, not a makeup or a moisturizer. So I just want to spend a few extra minutes on this myth. I don't need a high SPF sunscreen because it's all the same after SPF 15. Um, 
Let me rephrase that. It's all the same after SPF 30. Raise your hand if you would agree with that statement. It's all the same as after SPF 30. A couple brave souls. Who doesn't think that's a reasonable statement? OK. Um, about the same number. So you know that SPF really only has to do with UVB. It doesn't have anything to do with UVA. Um, and it basically gives you an idea of how long you can stay in the sun without burning. If you normally burn in 10 minutes without sunscreen, you use SPF 15. You can spend 10 times or 15 times longer, 150 minutes without burning. And if you look at how much UVB your sunscreen actually uh, blocks, um, right around 15, you're getting the curve starts flattening out. 93%, SPF 30, 97%. SPF 45, 98%. So really, if you raised your hand when I asked the question if it matters after SPF 30 and you said it didn't really matter, you'd be right. Okay, it doesn't really matter. What's that extra 1% getting you between 97% and 98%? Not much, 1%. Um, so if you just take this at face value, you don't really need to use a sunscreen that has a label higher than SPF 30. The problem is that in the real world, nobody uses sunscreen the way the label says. So they determine the sunscreen rating in a laboratory. They apply it at 2 milligrams per square centimeter. Most people use about a quarter of that amount. And so we're not really getting the number that's on the label. And this has actually been studied. This is one study where they had 50 volunteers. They gave them an SPF 15 sunscreen to use. And then they measure the actual SPF. So they said, here, just use this how you would normally use sunscreen. And this isn't even applying makeup with that little SPF 20 in it or 15 in it that you're never going to put on as thickly as you might put on sunscreen. And then they so what, what do you think the actual SPF was that they got out of this? So just. They got the whole 15 out of their 15? No. What about answer C? They got 10. D. How many people think D? Five. What about E, SPF 2? So the answer is E, SPF 2. So using an SPF 15 sunscreen is just a waste of time. So it's just doing lip service. You think, oh, I've got to put sunscreen on. It's healthy. It's the right, right thing to do. It's really a waste of time. The way my teenage son wears sunscreen, he sprays it and then he walks through the mist. <laughs> He's getting SPF 2 out of that, probably, if, if that. Um, so uh, just going back to this, I really like high SPF sunscreens because nobody's going to use them right. You know, my kids make fun of me because I really put it on thickly. It looks white. I look really uncool. But at least I'm getting close to the SPF 85 that I'm putting on. Maybe I'm getting 45 out of that or 50. So I recommend at least an SPF 50, uh, the highest number you can find if you are fair-skinned or have a history of skin cancer. You know, you really want to use a high SPF sunscreen. The other thing that's really important about that is wearing a hat. So uh, sunscreens, they wear off, they wash off, they sweat off, they rub off, they don't get reapplied. And so a hat is a physical blocker, um, and uh, it's hard to use a hat improperly. Um, so hats work great. All right, enough said about that. So um, myth five, uh, an indoor tan um, is safer than natural sunlight. Um, definitely not. Um, as I said before, tanning beds emit UVA, and we now know that uh, tanning bed use, there's so many articles on this. Uh, are linked to melanoma, especially in young women under the age of 25 who are frequent tanning bed users. They have a statistically significantly increased risk of melanoma. Okay, so before I go into the next segment, which is really uh, the meat of, of, of this afternoon's talk about non-melanoma skin cancer, does anyone have questions about sunscreen? Yeah, okay, well, right here first, yeah. Mm -hmm. People rely. I, I have sun, you know, sunscreen on. I can be in the sun all the time. And I, I think that sunscreen 
is being used as a safety factor, whereas people should know that they're still getting a lot of sun and they're better off if they wear the hat, if they, they're not in the sun or walk in the shade rather than at the beat, you know, to do something. What do you think of that? So I think what I heard you ask is that sunscreens can give people a false sense of security and that's just one sun protective measure. And I couldn't agree more. So, you know, when our kids took our vacation to Hawaii or Mexico when they were growing up, we went to the beach early in the morning. We stayed inside, did, did indoor games uh, during the middle of the day, and then we went out late in the afternoon. And they still had a great time. <laughs> so you can only control people until a certain age. And so uh, after about 9 or 10, I lost all my control. But at least for those period of years, uh, I kept them pretty protected. Uh, from the sun, and I think seeking the shade, just being smart about sun activities, and if you know you're going to be out in the sun for more than just running to the grocery store or whatever, wear a hat, wear protective clothing, that's going to work way better than sunscreen. Yeah, what is the SPF of clothing like? Uh, so, you know, if you wore a very thin old white and cotton t-shirt, you're getting SPF 2 out of that, but they do make sun protective clothing that has SPF 100. For most of us, we don't really need that. Um, you know, we see people in our clinic every day that work outside and they wear a t-shirt and they have a tan line. So I know they're getting, you know, th some protection from their clothing. Probably SPF 10 to 15 from, from just regular clothing, um, which isn't bad. Better than nothing. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the question was, uh, if you tint your windows, does that help? Yes. I mean, UVA comes through glass. It comes through clouds. It's there from sunup to sundown. It reflects off of surfaces. UVB is blocked by regular window glass, though. So the UVA is not going to come through. Um, but or UVB will not come through, but UVA does. And it's just a matter of degree, really, and practicality. If you're a truck driver and you've got a strong history of melanoma, you know, you're going to need to pay more protection than somebody who's Asian and drives, you know, two hours a week. So I usually resist the urge to write prescriptions for tinted windows for my patients unless they have a really good reason. Yeah. Uh, how important uh, zinc, uh, titanium, you know, we hear that that's what really does a good job, especially mm. zinc. So physical versus chemical sunscreens, I didn't put any slides on this. Great question. Um, so lots of people don't like chemical sunscreens because they think the chemicals are bad for you and bad for the environment. I think there's a lot we don't know about that. There's probably some truth to that. We, w we worry about nanoparticles with the physical sunscreens like zinc and titanium. I think the physical sunscreens work better because they block the entire action spectrum of UVA and UVB, whereas the chemical sunscreens have holes in them, especially in the UVA range. They're not complete blockers. I think, th I, I personally like sunscreens with both physical and chemical properties. Um, and uh, if somebody comes to me and says, I don't want to use sunscreen because I'm worried about the chemical, the harmful effects of chemicals, I usually say that, well, w there's a known risk that sun causes skin cancer and you're trading that risk in for an unknown risk about possible harmful effects of putting chemicals on your skin. I think that's kind of not the best trade-off, trading a known risk in for an unknown risk. But I think we're going to know a lot more about that in the next five to ten years. So jury's still out. I'm going to move on just because I don't want to run out of time completely, but save your questions for the end and if there's time at the end we'll come back to sunscreens or whatever else you want to ask about. Okay, so let's just talk about keratinocyte cancer. Um, so I, I took this picture out of a textbook. I probably should have disclosed that to that CME person that kept on hounding me about my slides. Um, sorry about that. But you, to that CME person, she also told me that my lecture started at 11.30, when it really started now, which she got me back, or I'm getting her back. Um, so if you look at this cartoon, what you see in, in the um, far left is um, a cartoon that shows dysplastic, the gray cells for actinic keratosis. So the real difference between actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma is that it's just partial thickness dysplasia, not complete thickness. So once you get complete thickness in the center panel, you've got squamous cell carcinoma in situ. 
And uh, in the panel on the right, uh, there's a little island that sort of looks like a turtle. Uh, underneath that basal layer, layer of keratinocytes that shows uh, invasion. So squamous cell carcinoma eventually will invade into the skin. Sometimes you can go from actinic keratosis right to invasive squam. You do not need to go through squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And the other important thing to know is that most actinic keratoses actually don't progress to squamous cell carcinoma. They don't have the right mutations. They're, the immune system knocks them out. Probably about 5 to 10 percent. We just don't know which percentage will progress. So we like to treat all of them. Um, Actinic keratosis is really, really common, and if you see patients over the age of 40 or 45, you're going to see actinic keratosis on a regular basis. So there's a pretty broad differential, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, basal cell carcinoma. How many people have heard of the term lichenoid keratosis? A, a good number. I'm going to show you some pictures because I read all the pathology for our group, and I can't tell you how many times lichenoid keratosis is biopsied, mistakenly being thought of as squamous cell carcinoma in situ, actinic keratosis, or even basal cells. So I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Seborrheic keratosis. Um, I, I have a lot of residents that rotate through my office. The family practice residency uh, sends one resident a month. And if there's one thing that I want them to learn at a very basic minimum is how to tell the difference between a seborrheic keratosis and something else. So that's just basic primary care, minimum standard. Um, I'm sure all of you out there are excellent, but I get every single day referral for atypical moles and they're just seborrheic keratosis. So understanding how to tell the difference, I've got a couple pictures to show you today for that. Warts, uh, less common in older people. Younger people get warts. I think people get immunity after a while. We don't see warts that commonly in people over the age of 45 or 50. Um, disseminated superficial actinic porokeratosis. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. It's not uncommon. And inflammatory disorders like eczema and psoriasis. OK, so here's your typical forehead. Uh, guy in his 60s with a lot of actinic damage. Um, so that stuff, you can really feel that. This red stuff, if you feel that, it's rough. When I'm examining a patient with actinic keratosis, this is all AK. The whole forehead is basically an AK. If you run your fingers over that, you'll, it'll feel rough. And even before you can see it, you can usually feel it. So when I'm examining a person with sun damage and I'm looking for AKs, I'm going to look and feel simultaneously. I'm using two sense organs to do my exam, and I would encourage all of you guys to do the same thing. You're going to pick up a lot more AKs early, feeling and looking simultaneously. We usually treat these with liquid nitrogen. How many people have liquid nitrogen in their office? OK, so maybe two thirds. Um, there's no reason why you guys shouldn't be on the front lines uh, treating AKs. If I have somebody with more than 10 or 15 AKs at a visit that I'm going to be freezing, I'm going to think about field therapy. And I'll get back to that in a second. So here's some thicker AKs on the ear, very common location, on the back of the hand, a hypertrophic AK. These can be very resistant to cryotherapy. You have to freeze these harder, more like a wart, maybe a 20 second freeze thaw rather than a three to five second little blast, which is all you need for those very thin actinic keratoses. Um, and um, field therapy doesn't work very well for these really thick guys. So liquid nitrogen works best. Here's another really thick hypertrophic actinic keratosis on the scalp. It's outlined with some marker. The uh, person in our office who saw this patient biopsied it, thinking that it might be squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and then these guys, yeah, thank you for turning those down. Can you guys see those images a little bit better now? Yeah, sorry, we, I should have thought to ask them to do that earlier. Um, so this is DSAP, or disseminated superficial actinic porokeratosis. We see this commonly on the legs, a little less commonly on the arms, more in women than in men, and it always accompanies a sun damage picture. These are a nightmare to manage. Some authors think these are pre-malignant, but they're not really actinic keratosis. So how do you tell the difference? Um, they have sort of this 
trailing scale, if you sort of look at the individual lesions, the scale isn't on the outside, and there's a ring of scale. Most of the lesion is not scaly, so there's that ring of scale just inside the outside border. You can manage these with cryotherapy. They tend to be cryoresistant. Um, they're very difficult to manage, but they're not the same as exogenic keratosis. Okay, so here's a thicker uh, AK on the antihelix of the ear, right there. Uh, wouldn't be um, wrong to biopsy this. Maybe it's uh, already progressed to squamous cell carcinoma. Alternatively, you could just try to freeze it. Uh, and if it resists freezing multiple times, then I probably would biopsy that. And how many people out here can biopsy, have the uh, equipment and the, the confidence to do a, a biopsy? Excellent, okay. Yeah, good. So here's the forearm. There's multiple AKs. There's one bigger, thicker one right in the center. But if you look carefully, you're going to see others there, too. It tends to be a whole field that's damaged. Lichenoid keratosis, I alluded to this a couple slides ago. So a lichenoid keratosis is a host immune response to a solar lentigo. So imagine the brown spot that you see in the center here. It's got a little bit of redness over on the right side. So the immune system is in there. It's hunting. It's a little bit activated. And so there's some erythema. On the right, uh, you've got a background of solar lentigo and then some lichenoid keratosis. So they're basically solar lentigos with a host immune response. So they look a little red. Sometimes they're a little irregular, a little tan and a little red. Um, and then they can also thicken up and grow into seborrheic keratosis. So this is a classic illustration of that. So um, a very uh, minimally raised um, erythematous to tan, stuck on, appearing lesion that you can just freeze if, the, if, if you want to treat it at all. Here's one that's a little more well-developed, growing into a seborrheic keratosis. Very stuck on look there. Okay, so as I said, cryotherapies are our mainstay of treatment, but I just want to talk about field therapy because if you need to freeze a lot of AKs, you probably need some sort of field therapy. So if you're treating the scalp or the face and you're having 20 or 30 or 40 AKs, you really need something more. And so the, the, the top five field therapy modalities are on this slide. So 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, that comes as a 0.5 or 5%, apply twice a day for four to six weeks. You have to warn your patients that their skin is gonna break down it's going to get raw. It's going to be painful. They're going to hate you. They're going to wish that they had changed to a different primary care doctor or dermatologist uh, before they had met you. And you need to set their expectations. It's really tough to go through this. And socially, it's hard. If you have to go to work, if you're in the public, it's, you're pretty messed up. And so I usually have patients back around three to four weeks of treatment for a little hand-holding. Uh, maybe part of their face is fully cooked and you're done there, but maybe another part needs another week. And so that endpoint is very variable and patient dependent. So you need to do a little counseling when to finish. And then when people are done, I give them some triamcinolone just to cool things down for a week. It makes a really big difference. Um, Miquimod um, can also be used. It comes as a variety of different percentages, as you can see on the slide. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can do twice a week, you can do five times a week, you can do every day, you can do two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, six weeks straight. There's a plethora of different articles about how to use this uh, molecule. And it's kind of like 5-FU. It's very patient dependent. Some people have a very, very robust response and get eroded, broken down uh, patches and can't do the whole six weeks. So, and again, you need to, set their expectations, make sure that you're welcoming them back into your office for a visit so you can hold their hand and manage that end of therapy um, with them. Uh, diclofenac is an NSAID. I don't think this works very well in my personal experience. Um, you get much less irritation, but I think you get personally much less efficacy. You have to, you have to use it for a long time, three months. Um, which is a lot to do. PDT, or photodynamic therapy, is used a lot. It's one day, so it has a lot of advantages over 5-FU and, and imiquimod. 
Um, it's alpha levulinic acid. You paint that on the face um, after doing an acetone scrub. They incubate for an hour or sometimes an hour and a half or two hours, and then they get uh, exposed to, we use a blue light source in our office for 15 or 16 minutes. They're extremely photosensitive for 24 hours. So if they go out and play golf the next day, they're gonna get the worst sunburn of their life. I had one lady who was in a play that night and just under those big, bright stage lights, she got a horrible phototoxic reaction. She did great, but uh, those fir that first week afterwards, she was pretty upset. Um, the disadvantage for PDT is you had to have a blue light uh, machine in your office and it cost about $8,000. Um, it's not very profitable either, so if you're going to spend the money doing that, you have to buy the drug from the drug company, and it's way overpriced, and you can barely break even on it. Um, but for the patient, it's a great patient service because um, it's one day, and then they're done. They peel a couple days later. It's not like using 5-FU for six weeks and being miserable. It's one day or maybe a couple days of discomfort. Um, and then uh, the last uh, item I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The, the trade name is Picado Inginal Mebuid. It's made from an Australian weed. Um, and it actually is very potent. It's only three days of treatment on the face or scalp or two days on the trunk and extremities. Um, you can have a very robust uh, response to this. It, the efficacy data looks great. There is a recurrence rate, though, uh, with these. And it's very expensive. So that's the one disadvantage. So those are your choices for field therapy. Um, let's just move on to Bowen's disease and squamous cell, and I'll take a little pause there and see if you guys have questions. Um, so squamous cell carcinoma in situ uh, can look like a patch of eczema. It can be very misleading. It's hard to tell the difference between this and superficial basal cell. They look very similar. Um, and uh, you need a biopsy really to tell them apart. So this lesion looks more infiltrated. Uh, this has moved beyond. If you biopsy the perimeter, maybe you'll get squamous cell carcinoma in situ. But if you biopsy the center, you're probably going to see invasion. So uh, squamous cell carcinoma is very common, second most common skin cancer after basal cell, affecting over 200,000 people a year. Um, they can metastasize, but they have a very low metastatic potential. Um, this is what it looks like under the microscope. Um, so I'm getting some feedback. Um, OK. Here is normal skin. So that's your stratum corneum. This is your epidermis, dermis. Um, and you can see here that there's an erosion of your stratum corneum. And then you've got these abnormal squamous cells that are infiltrating and invading into the dermis. Here's just a close-up of those abnormal dysplastic squamous cells with the darker purple. Those are the nuclei, so there's a lot of nuclear variability. They're making keratin unevenly and uh, invading into the dermis. So there's a variant of squamous cell carcinoma that we call keratoacanthoma, very rapidly growing, they, like a volcano. I mean, within a month or two, boom. They can, this one's in front of the ear. They can be on the extremities. They tend to be very well differentiated. They're not usually metastatic, although there are case reports of metastatic keratoacanthoma. We treat them just like squamous cell. We excise them. Um, but they're very characteristic. Another squame. You can tell this is not a seborrheic keratosis. The surface is ulcerated. Uh, it's irregular. Um, here's another uh, squamous cell carcinoma on the lateral forehead. Infiltrated behind the ear. So nasal labial fold. This was after most surgery. So it was a little bigger than what met the eye. And then after repair, I'm not trying to scare you, but I am a little bit. Um, so the lip, another common location. Um, OK, so I'm going to, uh, let me just go through basal cell, and then, and then I'll pause for questions. Um, basal is the most common skin cancer. Uh, doesn't hardly ever metastasize. I think the, the, the number in the literature is 0.04%. I bet it's actually less than that even. 
Um, it can cause a lot of local damage, though, and if you don't, if you neglect it, it can invade into the skin, cause a lot of local uh, morbidity. Um, here's our superficial basal cell, looking a lot like that superficial squamous cell I showed you. Um, you might, uh, you need a biopsy to, to diagnose that. Uh, you could use a Niquimod, which is FDA approved for superficial basal cell. You could do curatage and desiccation or excision. You could also do radiotherapy. I didn't put that on the slide. This is a back of a very sun damaged person, and that's a superficial basal cell that I outlined in pen. It looks like nothing. Um, and I guess maybe it wouldn't be that bad to miss that because uh, it's so small. Um, and can't really hurt the patient, but within a couple years, you'd probably recognize it as a nodule or basal cell. Um, so that's a, a typically pearly papule. They, if you leave it there long enough, the center will start to erode. So that's an, an eroded pearly papule. Here's some more pictures of basal cell on the side of the nose, uh, forehead, scalp. Um, so uh, in these locations, we're usually going to treat basal cell carcinoma with Mohs surgery. It has a higher cure rate, and it's tissue sparing. So a little basal on the back, you're going to excise that on the arms, excise that. But on um, a higher risk area, an area where it's hard to close, like the side of the nose, you really want to use Mohs surgery. So here's basal cell under the microscope. Again, our normal skin here. And then here's our. Uh, this is uh, our epidermis, and you can see these islands of basaloid cells um, that are invading into the dermis. Uh, just here's another one. Um, normal skin on the bottom and islands of basaloid cells invading into the dermis. Um, so there are high risk, higher risk basal cell carcinoma subtypes. So a micronodular basal cell, so that would be, an, this is an example of that where the islands are smaller. They tend to have more subclinical spread, so if you just take it out with a three millimeter margin of safety, you might get a positive margin. So if the subtype is micronodular or even infiltrative or morphic, you might want to send those cases for Mohs just because 100% of the margins are evaluated before the patient leaves the office. Um, so another example. This is a morphic BCC. It doesn't look like much. It looks like a little erythematous scar. That's what the extent was after Mohs surgery. So much, much more subclinical spread than you might think just by looking at the lesion clinically. And then after repair, um, on the upper lip, after repair, and nasal sidewall, so just a little um, erosion, really, nothing more than that. So sometimes basal cell can be endophytic, it's growing down and not out. So for something that bleeds, but there's not really anything there, in a sun-exposed area, especially the nose, that's basal cell until proven otherwise. So a lot of subclinical spread, that was the defect that resulted after Mohs, um, and they just take one, little area at a time. If there's something there at 2 o'clock and 9 o'clock, they take another layer just around what's positive over and over until it's all gone. So they're only taking out what they need. That is much bigger than that. So if you look at where the surgeon put the dots around, the skin cancer isn't just in that eroded part. It's all around that erythematous area. So it's much bigger than it seems to be. And then after repairs, a little skin graft. Okay. So again, this is a more of a morphic basal cell. You can tell it's very sclerotic and scar-like. Um, and then uh, after most surgery, after repair, another one to repair. So as I said before, if you don't treat basal cell, eventually they will cause a lot of problems. This is what we call a rodent ulcer. They basically just burrow into the skin, um, and uh, they can cause a lot of pain, bleeding, infection, morbidity. This guy, this is extreme. This guy, I got, someone sent me this picture from the ER about six months ago, homeless guy uh, who didn't have his basal cell treated. Hopefully I'll never see another case as bad as this. Um, 
So before I switch gears into melanoma, my last couple slides, I just want to open it up for questions about keratinocytes, skin cancer, uh, and yeah, in the back. Any comment about laser therapy for any of these lesions? Uh, so I don't know of an FDA-approved laser for keratinocyte skin cancer. There's CO2 ablation, um, but I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not aware of any laser that, that treats skin cancer. Yeah. How did you treat that last picture? So um, there, that's a good question. I didn't have the chance, but if I did, um, there is a product by Genentech that is, um, uh, it's called um, Vimosageb, and it affects the hedgehog signaling uh, pathway, and it's very effective for inoperable basal cells, so I would put him on that. He never showed up at my office, unfortunately. Other questions? So my timer says 30 seconds. Does that include Q&A? Do I have more time after that, or is that it? Okay, you guys, uh, we'll do a quick tour of, of melanoma. Any more questions about that last segment? Okay. Um, so melanoma has, uh, incidence has been increasing dramatically over the last 50 years. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, melanoma in situ as well, which is when you want to find it, because it's essentially 100% curable when you can find it in situ. Uh, here's just a, a graph that illustrates the, the rise in melanoma incidence um, over the last, uh, since the 1970s. For African Americans, we haven't seen a big increase. It's mainly in the Caucasian population. Um, so really, uh, primary prevention is really, uh, I think, the most important um, aspect. So education, sun protection, that's why I spent the first 10 minutes talking about sunscreen. Uh, and sun protection, I, I feel like that's really the time to intervene as early in life with sun protective measures. Um, so what about this? So this is a seborrheic keratosis. So it's a stuck on, um, I should have brought 20 pictures of seborrheic keratosis. They can come tan, white, gray, brown, jet black, or any color in between. Um, but they have sort of a stuck-on character. Um, you can almost pick them off. Uh, very different than, and it's, it's, it's a keratinocytic hyperplasia. So it's not melanocytic, it's keratinocytes. So if those keratinocytes thicken up, it, the skin looks darker. So for melanomas, uh, we're really talking about ABCDs sometimes for how to pick out the concerning lesions. Do they violate the ABCDs? For some who have a lot of moles, we use the ugly duckling uh, criteria. So which spot doesn't look like all the other spots? That's what I'm going to biopsy, because you can't biopsy 100 things. So um, asymmetry, the two halves of the lesion don't look the same. Hopefully nobody would miss this. Uh, border, the melanomas often have a very irregular border. Benign things grow in a symmetric way when they do grow. So uh, I see a lot of kids with moles, and so they're going to be changing as, as kids are growing. But so I tell families, you know, if it's a millimeter bigger next year, you know, and Johnny grew six inches, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. Symmetric growth is okay, but focal growth would get my attention. So a new black bump in the mole a finger-like projection growing out of one edge. Half the mole grows compared to the other half. That gets my attention. For adults, we shouldn't be acquiring new moles after the age of 50. So any new mole in a 50-plus-year-old is suspicious. I would just biopsy that. So what's often not talked about for the ABCDs is the letter E for evolution or change. Uh, diameter, here this shows just color, different colors in the mole. Diameter greater than six millimeters or a pencil eraser. To be honest, I don't find these ABCD rules that helpful. I have plenty of moles that are bigger than six millimeters. I think E is the key letter, evolution, change. So for some people, if I'm a little bit worried, but not worried enough to do a biopsy, or maybe they have a lot of moles, I might follow photo photographs. Take uh, body photographs. 
um, put them, attach them to the chart, have them back in four to six months, compare them to their pictures, teach the patient how to do a self-scan exam, um, and uh, you can follow uh, abnormal mole patterns that way. Okay, so here's just a couple. I just uh, pulled up our photo system for the last two weeks and just wanted to see what was out there. This one would scare me. I'm not sure I would have biopsied that. That just slightly irregular macule, that was melanoma in situ. So uh, Dr. Lagai Park from our practice biopsied that. Um, and, uh, but you can see that it doesn't look like the background lentigos, does it? Looks a little different. There's something about that that tripped her radar and she biopsied that. That's when you want to find melanoma. When it's in situ, you cut it out, you're done. Um, here's another one that came in, came through just a couple weeks ago. Uh, this looks a little funnier than the last one, um, but doesn't look crazy, crazy. Uh, but it's got a black, it's got a darker raised area. The border is irregular, so the right and left side don't match. It's got multiple colors. I mean, most people would be suspicious of this, rightly so, and this would need to be biopsy. This was a spitzoid melanoma, 0.7 millimeters in depth. Um, I want to say just a couple words about lentigo maligna. Um, this is melanoma on sun-damaged skin. It's melanoma in situ on sun-damaged skin, and it tends to behave a lot more like keratinocyte cancers. So those are keratinocyte cancers on sun-damaged skin. This is a melanocytic cancer on sun-damaged skin. They're not as aggressive as something like this. That's going to grow in a more nodular way and invade and metastasize much more readily. Then this thing is just going to spread out and slowly grow. Um, they're still melanomas, and they still need to be get, uh, taken care of, but they're not as aggressive. I think of a more, and, and the genetic connection isn't as good. So on older people, 70, 80, that get lentigo malignant melanoma, I'm not so worried about their family or their kids. It's people who get melanomas in their 20s and 30s, they have a stronger genetic component, obviously, because they develop their melanoma earlier in life. So another large uh, lentigo maligna. So if you just took a piece of this, just looked at this bottom part in isolation, they didn't have all this, that you could think was just a lentigo. But when you take the whole lesion, it's an entirety, it's really big, it's very irregular, uh, and um, you know, you, you're right to be suspicious of it. It's more than lentigo maligna. It, or lentigo, a solar lentigo, it used to be a solar lentigo, and now, it's transformed into lentigo malignant melanoma or melanoma in situ on sun damaged skin. Oh, great question. Thanks for interrupting me. So, um, usually, if you're worried about melanoma, you want to do an excisional biopsy. The, the pathologist, if it's not a straightforward case, uses circumscription in order to tell if it's benign or malignant. And if you don't, if you transect the lesion, the pathologist does not have that tool of using circumscription because you can't tell where the lesion ends. So you want to do an excisional biopsy of melanoma in every situation except for this one. Um, it's not practical to do an excisional biopsy here, and if this wasn't as severe like maybe that one, that might just be a lentigo. That's a little funny looking. You don't want to put a big hole in someone's face for something benign. So I would recommend doing three or four small partial biopsies in the weirdest areas and tell the pathologist that they're partial biopsies so they know. So uh, in general, you want to get down to the fat layer. Um, in this case, lentigo maligna is very superficial. So if you can do a shave and know that you're under where the melanocytes are, go ahead. So usually when I have residents rotate through the office, it's in this one scenario, do as I say, not do as I do, I shave melanocytic neoplasms every day because I know, I can tell how deep they are. So um, I'm not going to shave that because I know it goes deep, but I would shave that or, some, or that first one I showed you, that one, I would shave that off completely. And you don't have to go that deep to do it. But if you're not comfortable about where those melanocytes might wind up, then you should do a punch to remove it because you want to do an excisional biopsy if you can. Okay, so this is the last case. I, it's a, just a 12-year-old who came into the office not that long ago. They were late for soccer practice. I had to block the door to prevent the mother from taking his child home and not letting me biopsying it. 
Uh, this is the undersurface of that excisional biopsy. You can see that this horrible, scary, keep me up at night. And that was a pretty invasive, uh, aggressive melanoma. Um, so I'm not going to go into a huge uh, thing about melanoma treatment, just to say that thin melanomas, uh, excision is your mainstay of treatment. I'm not going to go through all the guidelines. You can look them up or just send them to a dermatologist. For thin melanomas, that's less than 0 0.7 to 1 millimeter excision, and you're done. For thicker melanomas or melanomas with high-risk features like uh, ulceration or a uh, higher mitotic rate, uh, then you're going to need to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and I just send those people to a melanoma center. We have one in Santa Rosa. There's one in San Francisco. Um, so they can get a comprehensive uh, care for their melanomas. Thank you. Can you take one or two questions if you're, somebody has one? Dr. Nakai. Yes. Um, <coughs> Uh, I see a lot of patients who their bag of vitamins and supplements is ginormous, and it's not uncommon that they're for skin and hair health. Mm. And on WebMD, talking about how there's decreased risks of cancer, taking selenium supplements and vitamin E and vitamin A, and I'm actually most concerned currently about biotin, because high-dose biotin can interfere with lab tests. I was just wondering any comments on general skin, and then this is saying a 30% reduction in cancer if you ingest selenium. So uh, I'm a skeptic. I, I need to see the data. There was a whole big thing that vitamin D was going to cure everything about five years ago, and more data came out, and it turned out that a lot of that wasn't really true. So um, I'm not going to talk people out of vitamins, but I, I'm a data-driven per person. If there's good data, I'll adopt it, and if there's not, I'm going to be skeptical. Over there and then, and then there, yeah. The question was, when do you apply your sunscreen? Just tell me when I'm out of town. I'm out of time, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so people say apply 20 minutes before, but that's the main reason for that is because they don't want people to realize that an hour after they're at the beach that they need to put their sunscreen on. So those physical sunscreens are going to give you an immediate effect. Chemical sunscreens might take a little bit longer, but you know, 10 or 20 minutes before is plenty. Um, and then reapply every three or four hours. Yeah. So what do you think of the little derm lights for skin exams in the office? And secondly, are you concerned about being replaced by an iPhone app? Oh, yeah. So um, I'll take the second question first. Definitely not. Um, and uh, the first question about the derm lights. So there is a lot of utility to using dermoscopy to help your exam. But it's not where you might think it might be. So if I'm suspicious something might be melanoma, I might do dermoscopy just out of curiosity, but I'm still going to biopsy it. Um, I sometimes use dermoscopy to uh, reassure my nervous parents of my patients. Um, but mostly what I recommend you all use dermoscopy for is telling the difference between melanocytic lesions and non-melanocytic lesions. So a seborrheic keratosis will have a signature dermoscopic pattern, and you're not sure if it's melanocytic or keratinocytic, you can use a dermatoscope to tell the difference. Angiomas that are dark purple look black. So is it vascular or is it melanocytic? Your dermatoscope will easily tell the difference. So for things like that, the dermatoscope is very handy. But to tell, you know, is there a blue-white veil or, you know, I think you can drive yourself crazy with the dermatoscope, and if you have a suspicion that it might be melanoma, it's rare that the dermatoscope is going to steer you away from doing a biopsy. The status of immunotherapy for melanoma? Immunotherapy for melanoma is kind of beyond the scope of my talk today. Yeah. That's a whole other lecture, an interesting one. Am I out of time? No, you can do one more. Okay. Question. Yeah. Why do you think the melanoma has gone up? Why do you think melanoma has gone up a thousand percent? In yeah, it's, it's a great question. So there's probably a variety of explanations. We have much better detection. So that little tiny thing on the back that I showed you that looked like nothing, that would have probably not been biopsied, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. 
Maybe that patient would have died of something else and no one would have ever known they had melanoma. So better detection. I really believe that tanning booths are a big factor, to be honest. And I think that environmental pollution is a factor. There's less data on that, but we know that the ozone layer in certain parts of the world has been significantly depleted, and those are the same parts of the world with the highest melanoma rates, like New Zealand and Australia. Okay, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. I'll be outside if you want to talk to me more. <laughs>